The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 3 The facially disfigured corpse lay slouched across the back seat, hands drooping, legs wide open and askew, letting the smoking gun rest where it had fallen into the dead girl's lap. The shot had done maximum point-blank damage. Those parts of the rear window that hadn't been blown through were now drenched with blood, bone chips, and tiny wet chunks of think box. Some of the mess had spattered forward, catching the kids and even reaching so far as to hit Kemper in the front windshield. The back seat was a mess and the rest of the van didn't look much better. Pepper had stopped screaming, but she was now in the grip of panic. She ran across to the side door and tried to open it. It wouldn't budge. Let me out! She cried. Then she started to pound on the inside of the door. Her hands hit metal and banged against the door windows. She had to get out. She, Andy, stepped forward, grabbed a hold of the door handle, and pulled the whole thing wide open. Pepper hurled herself out of the vehicle and found herself side by side with Aaron, who'd stumbled out of the passenger seat and immediately thrown up all over the side of the road. Aaron had been feeling nauseous for a few hours already, which is why she hadn't taken the joint from Kemper, but now there was no way she could hold it in, not after what she just witnessed. Aaron's sides ached as she retched up more and more acidic vomit onto the ground. It just wouldn't stop. Her eyes filled with tears, her face turned red, and her nose was stinging. But something kept hitting the puke spot at the back of her throat, causing her to hurl until she had nothing left to chuck. Soon all she could do was belch some vile tasting gut gas. She felt a hand on her shoulder. It was Kemper. You okay? He asked. No, I am not okay. What the hell did he expect? Didn't he see what just happened back there? She pushed him away and steadied herself in case her stomach went into spasm again. Behind them, Morgan slowly stepped out onto the soil. He held his arms outstretched in front of him. They had blood on them. The dead girl's blood. Christ! I could have been killed! Aaron shook her head. Some girl goes and blows her head off, and there's Morgan worrying about himself. Okay, Aaron herself had been scared when she first saw the gun, but now, Kemper thought differently. He could see how freaked out his friend was. It was written all over Morgan's face, just as the dead girl's blood had dripped onto the lenses of his glasses. We all could have, Morgan, agreed the mechanic. Andy walked over to the two of them. He was looking up at the sun, the sky. Did that really just happen? He asked. Kemper looked down at Aaron. She was getting it together again just fine, which somehow made Kemper realize that he himself was actually now in a state of mild shock. I've never seen anyone die before, he murmured. Most people never do, replied Morgan, equally bewildered. Is that supposed to make us feel better? Morgan had no answer for his friend. Instead, he had a question, one that had been on his mind ever since they first met that crazy girl out on the road. He stared at Kemper, in the face, and said almost accusingly, Why did we have to stop? The driver had no answer. Why did they have to stop? Why hadn't he just cut out the middleman and driven over the wacko when he first had the chance? She was dead anyhow. She killed herself, so what goddamn difference would it have made? The only difference Kemper could see was that they now had a dead body in the back of the damned van. 
She was lying there with a fucking hole in her head. She needed help, asserted Aaron, filling in the blank left by Kemper's non-reply. But Morgan was almost reading Kemper's mind. A lot of good we did her! Aaron shook her head. There was no point arguing with Morgan, especially when he was this panicked. The guy was terrified, but then maybe that was partly due to with him being more than a little stoned. Aaron found that she was now okay to get up. Christ, her puke smelled bad. It lay on the ground in thick puddles that were already curdling in the high noon of the scorching sun. She looked around at everyone. Andy and Kemper seemed okay, but not Pepper. The girl's screaming had been the loudest thing they'd heard after the gunshot itself. They picked Pepper up just across the Mexican border. She was a hitchhiker looking for a good time, and now she'd found herself in this. She was standing by the taillights, crying for all that she was worth. Through the shimmering heat haze, Aaron could see that the girl was hyperventilating. Aaron didn't know Pepper at all, but she sensed that the brown-haired girl was one of the good guys. She walked over to her, hoping to calm her down. Not that Aaron had much success reassuring the teenager with the revolver. I, I can't, stammered Pepper. I can't believe she did that. Why us? Why did she have to pick us? Aaron was a little disappointed that Pepper seemed to be taking the Morgan line on this, but she supposed it was understandable. Sure, their main thought should have been for the dead girl, but then Aaron wasn't exactly thrilled by the deep shit they were in now either. The two girls hugged and Pepper broke down in tears. One death on the road, hundreds, thousands of deaths in the slaughterhouse. Kemper climbed out of the van and chucked a fifth of Jack Daniels on the ground. Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey all the way from Lynchburg. It was there if anybody wanted it. He was using a shop rag to wipe the blood off of his skin, but in this heat it was drying already, changing from scarlet to deep rust. Kemper tried spitting on it, but it didn't help much. None of them were having much success in getting cleaned up. Morgan had found a tiny piece of her skull caught up in his hair. The girls had stepped aside, moving far away from the van. Kemper could see Erin trying her best to help clear Pepper's head, which wasn't going to be easy in this heat. Good luck to her all the same. Kemper stayed over by the guys. Andy was sitting on the floor outside of the open side door, his face a study of intensity, his shoes kicking dirt. Morgan stood nearby, cleaning his arms. Both of them were breathing heavily. Kemper could hear them their lungs moving in and out over the faint whisper of a mild Texan breeze. What are we going to do? Asked Morgan. Kemper paused and pulled his lips back against his teeth, making a smacking sound. I don't know. He said vaguely. We're going to have to call the cops, I guess. Morgan stiffened and began to pace. (laughs) On the list of bad ideas, he rattled. I put that way up there. Then he started to strut, and when he next spoke, it was in a kind of sarcastic, officious voice. So officers, as you would expect the crime scene, which is now our van, please ignore the colorful piñata filled with marijuana that you may happen to come across. It played no part, whatever, in the demise of this unfortunate young lady. Keep your goddamn voice down. Kemper chided. He looked across to Aaron to see if she'd heard. Sweat stung his eyes. It was getting even hotter out here. But Aaron was still busy with Pepper. If she had heard anything, she wasn't showing it. When Kemper turned back, he saw Andy watching him with a playful expression. Cat's out of the bag, man, said Andy teasingly. She knows what we picked up in Mexico. Oh, just great. That's all Kemper needed. 
like she hadn't been moaning enough about weed already today, and now she knew where... Wait, what's that? Kemper could hear an engine. A car was headed their way. He could hear it. It was coming from the direction they were going before Miss Suicide 73 decided to give her Smith & Wesson a blowjob. Now the others could hear it too, and an unspoken question immediately flashed between the five of them. Should they try to flag the car down for help, or should they let it go? A lot would depend on who it was. If it was the police, no. Kemper could see it now, and he couldn't believe his eyes. The automobile drawing close to them was a 1956 pale blue Buick four-door sedan. Only it wasn't pale blue anymore. Not underneath all them layers of dirt and rust. But what could you expect for a 17-year-old car? God damn it, Kemper thought those things had gone out with the Ark. He tried to see who the driver was, but there was too much glare across the windshield. Then he looked round at his friends, all five of them, unkempt and covered with blood stains. He imagined what the driver must be thinking. Nothing wrong with his picture, huh? He said ruefully. He wasn't surprised when the Buick passed them by. It didn't stop. It didn't pause. It didn't even slow down to check what was happening. It just moved along, like there was nothing to see. And all the time, Kemper couldn't make out who was sitting behind the wheel. Morgan interrupted his contemplating. We've got to stash the weed somewhere until all this bullshit is over. The stoner had a point. They couldn't do anything as long as they had the drugs on board. They couldn't call the police. They couldn't let anyone enter the van. They couldn't do nothing. Okay, Kemper, my man. Time to turn this thing around. Without even nodding to acknowledge what Morgan had just said, Kemper went back inside the van and came out holding the pot-stuffed piñata. He could see that the two girls were walking back over. Pepper looked much better. In fact, she looked kind of vulnerable, sexy. Stop right there. Kemper shook his head and went searching among the plants and bushes for somewhere to stash the cannabis. He'd have to put it someplace where it would be safe for at least a few days, and he'd have to be able to find it easily again, out here in this wide open expanse of nothing. Over his shoulder, he heard Pepper say, Can we just... Wait for a highway patrolman or something? She was talking to the others. That Buick was the only car they'd seen in the last 20 shitty minutes, so Kemper didn't expect help to arrive anytime soon. He heard Morgan reply to Pepper, but didn't listen to the answer, because he'd found a dip in the earth just beyond a weird-looking rock. It was a large pale stone that was wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, and dirt on the surface of the stone made it look almost like a death's head which seemed more than a little appropriate considering the circumstances. When Kemper was sure the dope was safely hidden and when he'd memorized the place where he'd buried it, the lonely tree towering above the van by the roadside, he went back to talk with Aaron. He led her away from Pepper, who was still trying to convince the other guys that someone might come and help them any minute now. Sure, and whoever it was would just wave a magic wand and make everything go away. Aaron was looking much better now, but he knew they had a growing rift to fix up. Baby, I'm sorry. He said quietly, his eyes looking over to where he had hidden the piñata. I did that for us. But she was too angry to listen. The whole drug thing seemed to be getting out of hand. You think I wanted to be a part of that? She snapped. Then there was a quiet pause. I'm sorry. He tried, before leaning to kiss her on the cheek. Aaron was unmoved, and she still looked pretty hacked off even when the damp hair of his mustache brushed softly against her cheek. Maybe she was overreacting. Maybe her feelings were fueled by what had just happened with the dead girl. But then maybe they shouldn't be having this conversation in the first damn place. Maybe Kemper shouldn't have done anything that he needed to apologize for. Maybe he should act like a man for once. Kemper was about to try again when Pepper's voice came up behind them. Well, I'll tell you this much. She announced. There is no possible way I am getting back into that van. Which wasn't really an option. They couldn't stay here. They just couldn't. Waiting on the off chance that some authority figure might calmly roll up and confidently take command of the situation. 
no one was looking for them. No matter what the crazy girl said before she took her own life, there was no cavalry. No one was out there. So, they were on their own, and they had better get used to the idea and do something about it. And the only thing they could do was deal with the body. They had to take it someplace, which meant getting back inside the van. They didn't have to like it, but there was nothing else they could do, which gave Pepper a choice. Either she got back in the van, or they could leave her there on the road. For a moment, Pepper gave serious consideration to staying behind. After all, they'd picked her up near the border. So who was to say she couldn't get another ride from someone else? Hell, if Kemper had stayed on the interstate, she wouldn't have this problem right now at all. There'd be a whole lot of cars to choose from. Still, Andy was kind of cute. But the jury was still out on Morgan. And then there was the body of that dead girl. What clinched it for Pepper was the stink of Aaron's puke. It somehow crystallized things for her. What would she do out here on her own? Where suicidal crazy women go around hassling strangers with guns. Okay, okay, okay. Pepper climbed back aboard the van with everybody else and Kemper turned the ignition. He knew they were somewhere near a town or someplace from that road sign they'd passed earlier, but he didn't expect to find a properly equipped hospital out here. Not that they needed a hospital. It was too late for that. What they needed now was a police station and a morgue. The five of them huddled near the front, Kemper behind the wheel, Aaron in the passenger seat, and the rest of them as far away from the bloody sofa as possible. Pepper was spraying perfume all over herself, her long floral patterned skirts, her legs, boots, bare arms, back and shoulders, hair, anything to combat the stench seeping out from the dead body. The smell had only just started, probably something to do with the time it takes for a corpse to start rotting, but already it was getting real awful. It reminded Pepper of something. It reminded her of, oh God, it reminded her of that slaughterhouse. The body had been propped up. It sat upright. Kemper had done that. He'd put some oily shop towels over her face. Blood had already soaked its way through the thick fabric. But better the sight of that than to have to spend another second looking at that god-awful mess of a face. Sure, they'd seen it when it first happened. They'd seen the cordite blackened hole and the chewed up bleeding flesh. And now they had seen it again when they climbed back aboard. But that's no reason why they had to see it every goddamn second of the way. And so they'd put towels over her head. They dampened the horror, hidden it, muffled it by depersonalizing her. If they couldn't see her splattered face, the dead girl somehow wasn't real. She wasn't dead. She was just something abstract, a thing. A macabre exhibit posed artificially on the back seat before a shattered bloodstained window that formed a halo of flies behind her crimson, shrouded head. Instead of a corpse, she was now a necrobiotic portrait. She was the Madonna without child daubed in the pigmentation of gangrene. She was meat, repackaged, to disguise the moment when the bullet blew her brains out. Andy, however, was starting to feel just fine. It wasn't that he didn't care. It had scared him as much as any of them. It was just that he somehow was able to bounce back quicker. And now he couldn't keep from staring at the dead girl. So that's what brains look like. He pondered. Sort of like lasagna, kind of. The others said nothing. They just looked at him in disgust. 
Sorry. He shrugged. He then turned his attention from the girl to the rest of the van. Kemper, your interior is really fucked. They looked at Andy like he was something on the sidewalk that they just stepped in. I'll shut up. A few miles on, the landscape started to change. The clumps of trees became thicker, more dense. Although the earth was still dry and sandy, there were far more plants around and thickets of undergrowth. Suddenly, nature had become rampant, making the air much more humid and even more sweaty and uncomfortable for the kids trapped inside the van. God, how far was this town? They had passed the sign a couple of miles back, but still no hint of civilization. Kemper scratched at his goatee. I'll tell you this much. He snapped. The next hitcher is shit out of luck. No one rushed to disagree with Kemper. I just don't understand. Wondered Pepper aloud. Why did she do it? Morgan's answer was perhaps a little predictable. Maybe it was the drug? No. Aaron interrupted. You could see it in her eyes. There was something she was scared of. Then another thought crossed Aaron's mind. Something almost too much for her to deal with. God, she was our age. Dude! Shouted Andy, pointing forward over Kemper's shoulder. Gas station! They could see it, maybe a hundred fifty yards on the right. A gas station. A god damn gas station. That meant a phone and people who could help. Someone who'd know how to get a hold of the police. Food, cold drinks, maybe some beers, and a place to rest a moment. It meant someone they could talk to. It was the end of all their problems, all their troubles. They could call at the gas station, get set, then get back and be on their way to Dallas in no time. God damn it. No gas station had ever looked so goddamn good. It was like an oasis for the modern generation. Oh yeah, Kemper hooked the steering wheel and gently dabbed at the brakes. Everything had changed. From now on, the rest of the day was going to be a whole lot different. A whole lot different. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 3 of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. This was a bit of a short chapter. I would have had this chapter out a couple days ago, but we got hit with a crazy winter storm. It's happening in a large part of the country down here, and uh, we've had uh, rolling blackouts. They're doing them, uh, they're actually doing them on purpose to make sure that, uh, you know, the uh, circuits and stuff for the whole state. Uh, don't get overblown or some shit. Uh, it's whatever. They're 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 making people go without power for like an hour, two hours at a time. Turn it back on, then turn it back off somewhere else. It's crazy. I guess there's some science behind it. Some reason. Uh, all I know is I freeze my ass off waiting. Um, but anyways, yeah, this has been chapter three. I want to say great job to all of our voice uh, actors for this. All of our guest patrons. Uh, doing a great job, guys. Uh, some of you are, about, you know, your characters' lives are uh, getting shorter and shorter the further we go. Uh, but yeah, we're about to pull into the gas station. Uh, anybody that's seen the movie knows this is where the ball really starts rolling down the shit hill. Uh, little little uh, <laughs> Mr. Leahy uh, thing there, the shit hill, uh, if you're a Trailer Park Boys fan. 
Um, yeah, so things are about to get interesting, guys. Uh, we're about to meet the sheriff, you know, pretty soon. I think maybe in the next chapter or two. He's probably one of my favorite characters from the movie. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how the book handles him. And, you know, the whole family and, and stuff in the town. Um, I think Stephen Hand is doing an excellent job with this novelization. He's really giving us more of an insight into the characters. Uh, maybe not at the Krista Faust level, uh, but still enough to make me care for the characters more than I did when I watched the movie. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how he handles uh, all the events of the movie and uh, what little extras he's going to throw us. I've already noticed a few little things different than the movie and a little few extra things that we didn't see in the movie. Uh, little bits of dialogue and interactions with the characters. And I'm curious to see if anything will be different when we get to the kills and uh, all of that stuff later on. <clears throat> I want to stress again, uh, you know, it's still a topic in this chapter. Um, if you ever feel the need to do so, uh, the number to the suicide hotline is in the description below. Uh, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Please call someone, talk to someone. Hell, talk to me if you need someone to talk to. Uh, LaRouse.exe at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. There's links to all my social medias in the description below. Um, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very serious thing. Um, there's always someone to talk to, so please take the time to talk to someone. Um, but alright guys, I will see you all very soon with uh, the next chapter. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you next time. See, I'm having to be crafty with that jump scare uh, because you're going to see it coming otherwise. Um, but seriously, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you all very soon.